So I want to do another example on this idea of predicting precipitation. This one is a little bit more complex and it's highlighted here. And that is we want to know if we want to precipitate magnesium ion, which is present in seawater. Let's say we want to get sort of a cleaner sample of seawater. Want to precipitate out the magnesium ion S, magnesium hydroxide. How would that happen? And so the situation that's given in this problem is that the original magnesium ion concentration is 0.059 molar. And then the seawater is going to be treated so that the hydroxide ion concentration is going to be maintained at that number. And the question is, if that's the case, how much magnesium ion is actually remaining in solution? As in, you know, by the addition of the hydroxide, you would precipitate the majority of the magnesium ion. And then the question that's more important is how much of the magnesium is precipitated. And generally speaking, in a sort of practical sense, you know, when you're trying to precipitate ions to basically remove it from a solution, as long as you can precipitate more than 99% of the ion, it's considered that the ion has been removed. So, so we want to check if this is the case in this situation. Again, I would draw a picture first just to illustrate the idea. We have a solution of seawater that contains some amount of magnesium ion, in fact, at 0.059 molar. And we want to add to this some hydroxide ion such that at some point we would precipitate all of the magnesium or most of it. And we want to know, well, how much of the magnesium ion are still floating around in solution at that point. And if that precipitation is considered good enough, meaning that more than 99% of that original magnesium that was present, which is this one right here, has been precipitated. All right, so to do the calculation, we really just, we're going to use the same exact QSP, KSP concept. And the idea here is to understand that what they're telling us is at the end, the concentration of hydroxide that's left in that solution is 2 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. Okay, so that means that we have this much hydroxide, how much magnesium would present at that point, magnesium ion? Well, we know that the product of magnesium and hydroxide squared has to equal to the KSP value. If we want to calculate the magnesium, then all we need to do is take the KSP and then divide it by the hydroxide square. We know the KSP value is 1.8 times 10 to minus 11. The hydroxide, we were told, is 2 times 10 to minus 3, so we're going to square that, and then that gives us a concentration of magnesium of 4.5 times 10 to the minus 6 molar. So that's how much magnesium is actually floating around this final solution right here, okay? And the question that becomes, is that a good enough uh, precipitation? Is it good enough to remove all the magnesium? You're never going to remove all of them, but is it good enough for practical purposes that we this seawater clear of magnesium ion? And so to calculate that, we do the following step here with the amount of magnesium precipitated. It's just the difference, right, between what you're starting with, this number right here, and what you have at the end. And that's the number we just calculated. So the difference of the two is just going to be this number right here, which is very close to the original number. So we know that most of the magnesium ion has been precipitated. To actually calculate how much, take the amount that's precipitated, divide it by the original, and that number ends up being 99.99%. So that means that this solution right now is clear of magnesium ion. We've been able to completely remove all the magnesium ions, at least as far as practically possible. Okay, so we just talked about in the previous section how to precipitate a particular ion by using the appropriate counter ion and calculating the concentration that's needed to make that precipitation happen, right? This actually becomes a strategy that uh, we typically use to help separate out different types of ions or other contaminants in a solution. So for example, if you have a water sample from a river and you want to test what kind of ions are present, a lot of times you are going to separate out the individual ions first through uh, a number of steps. And this is what we refer to as selective or fractional precipitation. And the steps are really illustrated in this picture right here. So you start with a solution that contains, say, three different ions, and you can add specific counter ions, which will act as a precipitant, so something that will help precipitate one or more of those ions that are originally present. And then once you precipitate some of this, like in this case, we have three ions, only two of them precipitate out and then the calcium stays in solution. Then you can do a centrifugation step where the solid is going to stay at the bottom of the test tube 
whereas the solution will be separated out in another test tube. And then we can separately analyze the ions afterwards. And of course, we can do further separation with the remaining ion and eventually get them to completely separate out. And so that whole process called selective precipitation is going to be done in the lab for you in several experiments. And so this is the concept of it. And the idea here is that for successful separation of two ions, you're going to have to precipitate out at least 99.9 percent of one of those ions so just like in the previous discussion we had about whether one ion is completely precipitated and we use that requirement of 99.9 percent the same idea here that for one ion to be separated from the other one 99 percent of one of those ions have to be completely precipitated out okay so we're going to take a look at this example here to see how this works in practice. So we have, in this case, silver nitrate that's slowly added to a solution that contains chromate as well as bromide ion. And both of these ions can precipitate when combined with silver as follows. So in the case of uh, silver chromate, we have a KSP of 1.1 times 10 to minus 12. And with AGBR, we have KSP of 5 times 10 to minus 13. So there's several questions that comes along here, which is one, which of these two ions will precipitate first? So just imagine that you have in your original sample just two of those ions the chromate and the bromide and you want to know when I add the silver in here which of those ions will precipitate first and then afterwards second question that follows is when you know once we figure out which one precipitate first we're gonna then see when that second ion starts to precipitate how much of the original ion is still there right the first ion is still there because what we want to know is, is that precipitation an effective step or not? Which means that for, like I said earlier, for a complete separation, you're going to have to have 99% of the first ion being completely separated out from the second one. And so that's what we're going to do here. We're going to do some calculation to show how that works. Uh, we start here by just thinking about which of the two anions would precipitate first. Now, for us to be able to answer that question, we need to calculate for each of the anion, how much silver is needed to start precipitation, okay? Now we know how to determine that, figure out when QSP is equal to KSP for each of the insoluble salts that we have, right? So for the chromate ion, our insoluble salt is Ag2CrO4, which splits into two silver and one chromate ion. And so the QSP expression looks like this, Ag squared times chromate, and that should equal the KSP value for precipitation to start to happen. We're interested in this case to calculate concentration of silver, so we'll isolate the silver out and we'll have this expression, the square root of the KSP over the concentration of chromate, which gives us this value as the amount or the concentration of silver we need to start precipitating our chromate. We can repeat the same calculation with the second soluble salt which is AGBR, which is splits to Ag plus and Br minus. Calculating Ag in this case using the KSP of AGBR gives us a value of 5 times 10 to the minus 11. Now, what you need to conclude is compare these two numbers right here. Based on the two numbers, it's clear that this is a much smaller number, which just means that it takes a lot less silver to precipitate bromide compared to the amount that it will take to precipitate the chromate ion. So therefore, AGBR would be form first, okay? That will precipitate first, in this case, the bromide ion. Now, the next question then becomes, when the second ion, which is the chromate, starts to precipitate, how much BR is still floating around? Because remember, the BR precipitates first. What we want to know is when the chromate starts precipitating, which is a little later, how much of the bromide is still around? We can calculate that because earlier we had determined that the chromate would start precipitating when the concentration of silver is 1.05 times 10 to the minus 5. So another way to ask this question is just saying that when my silver is 1.05 to the minus 5, what is my bromide concentration? So what I need to do is reset up my equation again, Ag times Br equals to the KSP of AGBR. And again, we're, in, we're using AGBR here because that's the one that we're interested in. We're trying to calculate BR minus concentration, but we're using the value of Ag plus that we got earlier for the silver chromate So calculating that tells us that at this point, when chromate starts precipitating, this is how much bromide is still floating around. So bromide ion, okay? And then, so the last question, if you look back at the problem, 
says, is this a complete separation or not using fractional precipitation? Well, the requirement is to have 99% of the one of the ion completely precipitated while the other one still remains in solution or while the other one starts to precipitate. So why don't we do that calculation? So we just found out that originally had 0 0.01 molar of bromide, and then keep adding the silver, the bromide starts precipitating. And then if we keep adding the silver, eventually the second ion, the chromate would also start to precipitate. And when the chromate starts to precipitate, this other number, the second number here, 4.76 times 10 to minus eight, is the concentration of bromide that is still in solution. So that means the quantity that has precipitated is just the difference between these two numbers right here. That's why I'm doing a subtraction. I'm gonna divide it by the 0 0.01, which was how much bromide I originally have, multiply that by 100%, and I find that 99.9995% of my bromide has been precipitated. So yes, this is a very, good separation between the two ions because most of that first ion which is bromide is gone by that time in terms of no longer being in solution but in the precipitate and so we can then go back to this scheme and say we can centrifuge this at this point and then the agbr would stay there as a solid and then the solution portion which we can transfer to another test tube would then just contain the chromate ion